cool. Hey guys, so I'm Max, uh, as Molly said, one of the other fifth year medical students. There's a hell of a lot of you here today. And I'm normally the one sat in the crowd, kind of on my phone, pretending to listen on a Monday afternoon. So I appreciate you all looking kind of very attentive. And uh, as Molly says, if anyone's got any questions, um, ask me, or Molly's much more intelligent than me, so probably ask her. Um, and if I can just premise this talk with, chemistry is a really hard subject, okay? And I think some people say it's the hardest A level, it may be, it may not be, but if you find chemistry tough, don't let that put you off med school, okay? There's very, very, very little chemistry that we've done, and Oxford's quite an academic kind of medical school, and yet there are very few occasions that I can think of, maybe once or twice in pharmacology and things like that, but if you struggle with anything in chemistry, don't let that put you off applying to med school because it's not something that you will really have to rely on. I think it's, um, but hopefully, I'll give you a little bit of a talk about chemotherapy, um, and I'll try and just kind of make you see the bigger picture, what we're, what we're here for, but we'll also drill down a little bit into some chemistry um, and see where we go. So, okay, so what, what is chemotherapy? Okay, so it is one of lots of different types of treatment um, for cancer. And it has several different kind of approaches and, and contributions to the treatment of cancer. Um, you know, ultimately, we'd ideally like it to cure cancer. Um, however, more realistically, it has a role alongside other things. So, for example, you've heard of radiotherapy already this morning. So people will have radiotherapy and chemotherapy, radio chemotherapy as it's called. And the, both the two of them work synergistically. They help each other out, okay? Um, and um, I'll talk, give you an example about that in, in a second. Um, secondly, and well, thirdly, to, to relieve symptoms. You know, cancer is, is, a, is a very nasty, aggressive disease, um, and if we can target it with some quite potent toxic chemicals, um, in a lot of cases we can help relieve symptoms. But we'll talk about some of the pros and cons of, um, of that later on. So monotherapy and combo therapy. Has anyone heard of monotherapy and combo therapy before? So they kind of do what they say on the tin. Monotherapy is one type of therapy, um, quite specific, targeted, um, that you hope will be effective. Combo therapy is more of a kind of carpet bombing approach, trying several different types of therapy all together. Because, because cancer cells, as Tom mentioned in his talk, um, kind of go off the beaten track. They don't kind of respond to the very well-conserved replication pathways that normal body cells do. They do their own thing, okay? So they're very hard to get on top of, to treat. And just like a virus that's mutating like HIV and is very hard to, to vaccinate against and things like that, tumor cells do the same thing, okay? They adapt, they are very sneaky, they're very clever. If you try and treat them one, with one thing, they'll mutate, and then all of a sudden, your monotherapy doesn't work, so you need to add in another therapy. It's a bit like antibiotic resistance, okay? If you, if, you know, at the moment we have a huge problem where we're using way too many antibiotics, uh, bacteria becoming resistant to them, and all of a sudden we're having to use stronger and stronger and more and more antibiotics to get on top of it. So it's a kind of a similar principle if that analogy, if that analogy helps you. So, chemotherapy before surgery is a really, really important part of treatment, okay? Some people, cancers like bowel cancer, breast cancer, can have some quite large tumors, ovarian cancer, um, which can grow quite big before they're even detected, okay? And chemotherapy before surgery is a way of reducing down the tumor size before you go in there and try and cut as much of it out as you can. Now, as an example, um, in breast cancer, if you had chemotherapy before you had uh, your, your surgery on, on your breast, you only had to have a lumpectomy, which is just a small portion of the breast removed, rather than a whole mastectomy, okay? So that shows you that you have a much better outcome, both in terms of kind of cosmetically um, and in terms of tumor uh, eradication. And in those studies, there was no you know, increase in recurrence in the people who only had a lumpectomy compared to those who had a mastectomy. So it's, it's a very valuable treatment. Um, so where are we off to next? Okay, so let's do a little bit of chemistry um, and talk about the chemistry of alkylating agents. Okay, so alkylating agents is, is a group of, of chemotherapy drugs. Um, and they're the first non-hormonal drugs uh, to be used effectively in the treatment of cancer. And the, the story behind them is quite interesting. Um, so where did it all begin? Does anyone have any idea where chemotherapy first really came from? Any historians? Anyone doing history A-level? No? Okay, I'll tell you. 
So you probably do know. Um, so during World War II, uh, quite sad, but lots of chemical weapons were used. Uh, things like sulfur, gas, and um, they were chosen because they gave horrible effects like blindness, lung damage, horrible blistering effects. And obviously this caused a lot of, um, a lot of people to die and have horrible injuries. But the one thing that people did notice is that some people who had cancer had you know, amazing responses who'd been exposed to these gases. Um, and they found that they had, these, these gases had um, side effects where they would reduce down your bone marrow activity. So your bone marrow is where all the kind of immune cells and, and red blood cells all come from initially. And also the lymphoid tissue. So lymphoid is a very part, important part of your immune system. Um, and they noticed that you can actually sort of shrink down those, um, those systems so that people had resections of tumors um, and, and some just you know, amazing things. But obviously, it's, it's, not, it's not good enough to have these very small side effects in the context of blindness and lung damage and everything else. So what scientists did is they thought, right, well, how can we look at these chemicals to look at some other ones, purify them a little bit so they have less dangerous side effects, and go from there. So that's really where they came from. And they looked at uh, nitrogen um, mustards of, of, in a kind of similar time just after World War II. And they did trials with lymphoma and demonstrated that um, kind of tumors regressed um, and, and had huge relief of symptoms. So that's kind of where it all began and where it gained traction. And, and you know, chemotherapy is a field where it's constantly evolving. You know, we are not where we want to be in terms of treating cancers effectively with chemotherapy. There are still a hell of a load of side effects we want to try and reduce down. And, and maybe I'll come up later with that kind of idea of, of kind of personalized medicine. That might be something in the future um, where you can be very individual and specific based on someone's genome. You know, we can now uh, sequence a genome very, very quickly for, for not very much money at all. So, you know, that may be a direction that chemotherapy is going in. Um, and, you know, quite often in medicine, uh, discoveries come from places you don't expect them to. You know, this is one example that's a very sad example. Uh, another example that springs to mind, which is a slightly more amusing one, um, was you might have heard of the drug sildenafil or Viagra, um, a treatment for erectile dysfunction. And that was initially a drug that was in a trial for angina, okay, which is the kind of chest pain associated with cardiovascular disease. And they had all these old men who, who had angina and they gave them this drug and they, they all said, you know, how, how was it? And all the old men said, it yeah, didn't, didn't really help my angina, but we're not giving the drugs back. And I thought, okay. And they find out that they have this rather uh, desirable side effect. So um, there's another example of, of why, why drugs can sort of crop out of nowhere. So who's, stick up a hand if you've heard of cis-trans isomerism. Okay, wicked, most of you. Um, so isomers, I've kind of given the game away, but these are molecules that have the same molecular formula, okay, but they are arranged differently in space. Um, and stereoisomers, which is, is kind of the crucial thing in the context of chemotherapy, um, in the same order, but arranged differently in space because they don't have the freedom to move in space, okay? Um, cis trans, cis just means same side, trans means across, okay? I'm sure you already know that. So here's an example, here's a little cartoon, okay? Where we've got a molecule here. Um, I think this is 1,2-dichloroethene. Um, and we've got, uh, at the top we've got a double bond, okay? We've got a double bond between the two black carbons. Now, that double bond, as I'm sure you know, is fixed, okay? There is no free rotation about that double bond. So you have two isomers, you have the cis and the trans, the trans isomer on the left, cis isomer on the right, okay? Those are stereo isomers, okay? Compared to at the bottom, we've got a single bond, okay? Now, that molecule can freely rotate around its single bond, okay? If you imagine, if you made this model, and if you were able to move it without taking it apart, the molecule is exactly the same, and you haven't got stereo isomers. However, if you have to take it apart in order to change it so it looks different, then you have stereoisomers because there is a fixed, rigid double bond that prevents this free movement. Okay? So, here's just how you'd probably normally see it um, with, uh, with the molecule we've already spoken about. And now let's translate that to, to chemotherapy itself. Okay? 
So cisplatin is uh, a drug that's used uh, to treat lots of different types of cancer. It's a very effective alkylating agent. However, we've got cisplatin on the left and we've got transplatin on the right. Now, transplatin is not a drug used in chemotherapy, okay? And even though these molecules look pretty much identical, that key difference of having this kind of isomerism is what makes cisplatin effective and transplatin not. Okay? There are lots of other drug examples. If you've heard of L-DOPA, the treatment used in Parkinson's disease, okay? L is the one type of isomer. The other isomer will not be as effective. Okay? So well, the stuff you learn is relevant. Okay? It's really relevant. There are lots of other examples. There's um, antidepressants. Um, citalopram is another example of a drug that has cis-trans isomerism. Um, so... How do alkylating agents work? So if we think a little bit about what Tom was talking about before me, we were talking about these very, the, the word faithful is used in, in DNA replication. You need to be kind of faithful to the system to ensure that the, the kind of daughter cells are the same as their parent cells in mitosis. And it goes through this highly, highly, highly regulated involving these CDKs and cyclins. Now, with cancer cells, they don't adhere to the same rules, okay? Now, alkylating agents, and this another an example is cyclophosphamide, another very common uh, chemotherapy drug. What they will do is they will try and bind to the, the, there's the purine base, the anine and guanine bases of DNA, cross-linking it and trying to disrupt their replication. Tumor cells replicate a hell of a lot faster um, than normal cells, okay? They have a very kind of high metabolic turnover. They grow their own blood vessels. And so if you can try and interfere with that process, that is a very effective way at stopping tumor growth. There we go. But crucially, with, um, if you're targeting actively dividing cells, we've already heard that lots of cells in our body are actively dividing the whole time. Okay? The eye and, and parts of your brain are probably the only cells that aren't actively dividing the whole time. Your skin is turning over every month. Your, your gastrointestinal tract is turning over every so often. You know, these cells are actively dividing the whole time. Your hair, very, very actively dividing cell type, okay? Now, if you think of some of the side effects of chemotherapy, people lose their hair, okay? Very, very common. And that's why, because you're having this, this process that unfortunately isn't so specific enough to target just tumor cells, okay? It's targeting normal cells as well. And that's where you have to kind of weigh up the balance of, of is this effective? You know, is it worth doing? Is this person too old, frail, you know, unable to take on? And, and a lot of people make the decision that they don't want to have chemotherapy. And that's completely fair enough. You know, if, if you're not as resilient and, and you don't want to go through it, it can make you feel very sick, um, make you feel very ill and kind of unwell. And if you've got, you know, not a long to live, that's maybe not how you want to live the rest of your life. So it's, it's effective. Um, but it's not exactly where we want to be yet. Um, and I think that's why cancer is such an exciting field to be part of, because in, in our generation, there will be so many amazing discoveries to be part of, uh, and you guys will all be doing it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, a very short bit of chemistry. I don't think we're a tiny bit behind schedule, so I'll, I'll wrap it up 